Stockford. I'm the uh, Chief Technical Officer here at Sustainit. Um, I'm also one of the, the, the main director owners of the business. Um, we started the business um, um, about 2006, well, it's about December 2006 for those who don't know us, um, and we've been working in the sustainability arena now since then, um, initially starting off in the um, uh, the environmental area and we've moved into the, the whole corporate and social responsibility area of data management which is our prime um, remit for being here. So um, I'll just move on to the next slide. The next slide is uh, is not working. Okay so during, uh, during the talk today I'm going to be talking for around about 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to be talking around the EU directive and what it means to you. Um, we will cover uh, a brief history of corporate re reporting for those who um, are new to this, um, a bit about EU law, then we'll go into the directive, what it is, who it affects and what the options are and at the end we'll, we'll, we'll leave you with a, um, a question session. Um, approximately, as I say, approximately 20 minutes for the discussion um, for the talk and then uh, about 10 minutes for discussion at the end. So. Who are Sustainit? Um, as I said, we started in 2006. Um, we're primarily a data consultancy. Um, we deal with uh, non-financial data. That's our speciality. Um, and that non-financial data can cover everything from environmental, um, economic, uh, uh, employment law, whatever it is that you want to record that's not financial, that you then want to uh, set targets around and monitor, manage, and uh, implement. Uh, um, we help companies in, in various ways from um, initially uh, setting up policies if that's what you need um, through to setting up a system ISO 14001 compliant if you want to um, that can be spreadsheets that can be full software it can be whatever you like um, we also have a full technical support team here who help people um, with those systems whether that be software or spreadsheets um, we have uh, various uh, connections with vendors out there and uh, we are implementing implementation partners with quite a few so um, we, we, we we know the area um, technically and we know the domain quite well because that's where we work um, so that's a bit about sustain it and who we are and if you'd like to know any more then um, get in touch with Joe afterwards and I'm sure he'd be quite happy to talk to you about us so initially corporate reporting a, a, a brief history so um, Bear with me on this one if you if you know what corporate response responsible reporting is and where it's come from. Um, but I'm just going to briefly cover it for those who may not have. So um, it, corporate and sustainable re reporting has a long history and, and, and it goes back quite a long way into um, the early 80s when the first environmental reports were really published. Um, and it tended to be chemical companies and industries that had serious image problems that started to do this. Um, and the other, the other sort of edge to that was that we started to see early, early adopters um, looking at um, adding reporting to their management reports and creating environmental management systems. Non-financial reporting such as um, sustainability and CSR reporting though is a fairly recent trend which has um, pretty much expanded over the last 20 years. Um, many companies now are producing an annual sustainability report and there's a wide range of ratings and standards around that people are using. Um, there's a, and there's also a variety of reasons why companies choose to produce these reports nowadays. But at the core, they're intending to be vessels of transparency and accountability. And those, those words you hear quite a lot nowadays. Um, and it's, it's quite important that some, of, some companies are um, showing their stakeholders and their clients and their um, customers um, exactly what they're doing in these areas, um, especially when um, there are, are competition around um, that this, this this particular type of reporting helps to differentiate you from your your um, um, competitors. Um, the other thing is that the corporate reporting and, and now it's moved on is is now starting to um, improve internal processes, um, engage stakeholders, and even uh, persuade investors to invest in the companies that the, that are producing these reports. So. Um, the corporate responsibility reporting nowadays is, is becoming quite mature. Um, most large companies are now doing it. 
Um, from um, 2007, the Swedish government actually introduced it as a legal requirement. Um, 2010, South Africa did it. Uh, 2012, France implemented a, a mandatory reporting um, which included diversity in their particular uh, report. Um, and in 2013, as many of you know, if you're working within the arena in the UK, the um, 2006 Companies Act was amended um, to include non-financial reporting alongside the um, financial reporting of companies. So there are already some some countries in the EU who are uh, have moved from uh, voluntary reporting into mandatory reporting, um, and they tend to use frameworks such as the United Nations Global Compact or the Global Reporting Initiative or even um, CDP Climate Disclosure um, to to guide them in in what they're reporting and what these um, initiatives and frameworks are actually doing is helping people to uh, benchmark themselves against each other. So from that you can see that actually the corporate reporting is is, is not something new um, and the EU directive will add to this um, so we'll see how that affects that later on. If I can just very quickly jump in at this point as well, I think, I mean, I think David raises a very good point that you know, already and was it's, it's not something new i think you ha you also have to consider corporate and non-financial rep sustainability reporting um against probably the the other form of corporate reporting which is the financial side and when you look at kind of that the fact that that came in you know, from a legislative point of view primarily after the great depression so you know obviously early tw 20th century it's still a very it's still, in comparison to that, a very new landscape. And I think that's why over the last 10 years, you've seen so much change, so much shift in what's expected, in who's expected to do what, in how you're expected to report, which is why you know, people like myself talk endlessly about differences and requirements and all these kinds of things, and all good things. Just a thought. Okay, I'm going to pass you straight back to David. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, we're now going to just briefly touch on what EU law is um, because um, one of the things that um, I found particularly when I started to look at directives and what they are and how they work was I didn't really understand the EU legislation and the and the and the area of EU legislation. So what I did was I went on to do a bit more research, and I'm sure that um, although most of us think we know how it works, um, it, it, for me it was quite a surprise when I did have a look. So I'll just briefly cover it. I'm not going to go into any depth here, um, but just a brief covering to show you where the directive sits in EU law. Um, so uh, EU law is, uh, is divided into two categories. We've got primary law which is constituted by treaties and then we've got the secondary law which is constituted by regulations, directives, opinions and decisions. So um, already you can see that the, there are two distinct areas and uh, the primary law is the area where you would look for um, laws that get drafted um, and, th and they would be um, drafted by the European Union um, itself, the institution, uh, uh, the European Commission. Um, and it's not the members or the parliaments that draw up these drafts, it's the European Union that does. And then they're backed up by um, the, the members of the European parliaments um, who then have the, the voting rights on these. Then in the, the secondary law, you've, you've got these uh, directives and, and treaties, etc. And it, well, you start off really with the treaty, and the treaty constitutes the base of the European law. It's, it's establishing vital political organs and how they work, and regulations and directives and other acts are set in order to realize and put these practices and aims and goals and objectives stated in the treaties into, into place. Then you have the regulations, which have a, a direct effect on all of the European members um, and they are, they are applied in full. They're directly applicable without the need for any national legislation. So those, those first two um, are laws that can be put in place without having to be in national legislation and any, but any of the EU members will have to take those into account. Whereas the decisions and directives are slightly different. Um, decisions are released by councils or commissions and, and they're not addressed to all the, member, all, the, all the EU members. They might indeed be dedicated to a particular state, an individual or a company. And, and although they're not of general application, they are binding for the state or the individual or the companies that they are addressed to. 
So there's a, a very slight difference. But the one that we're really interested in is the directives. Now, the directives are there, and they have an indirect effect on all the member states. Um, basically, when a directive comes into play, uh, all the member states are required to put them into practice and into their corresponding national legislation within a set time frame, and that's usually two years. Um, and this is in order to realize the objective and the policy stated in the, direct in the directive. So, for instance, in the UK, directives are usually implemented by statutory, uh, can't even say the word, statutory instruments and occasionally by acts. Now, um, this, will, this, this directive that we're talking about here um, will, sorry, I got confused by something that's splashed on the screen. Um, this particular directive here um, will be put into place by an act. It will be a change to the uh, Companies Act in the UK. Um, European directives are used in, uh, normally to improve free trade, free movement, co and competition rules across the European Union. They can also be introduced to um, establish employment, safety, health, and social related common policies. So um, you can see from that that they cover a wide range of, um, uh, of topics there. Um, through, and, and through the introduction of the, the new domestic legislation, directives are likely to significantly affect businesses and companies as well. So what we're looking at here is that um, whenever a directive comes into place, initially it won't have an effect, but um, it, is, it is something that we should all keep our eyes on because we know that once they're in place, two years later, you're going to have to do it. So um, there we go. That's, that's just a, a, a brief, I don't think we need to go into any more about the law, um, but that just gives you an idea where directive sits. So let's go and have a look at the directive itself, the one that we're here to talk about. So the Directive 2014-95-EU um, on disclosure of non-financial and diversity information by certain large undertakings and groups amends the Accounting Directive 2013-34-EU. That's quite a big mouthful there. Um, what this actually requires companies to do is to publish management reports that integrate the financial and non-financial aspects of their business. Um, basically, it states that information on both financial and non-financial performances should be included, and here's the, here's the bit, to the extent necessary. Now, they don't actually detail what it is, they just say to the extent necessary, but without specifying how it can be done. So, they, first of all, they don't tell you to what extent you need to do this, and also they're not telling you how it needs to be done. But what will happen is that when this gets put into national legislation, that's where the boundaries around it will probably tighten up a little bit more. Um, so, um, while the uh, uh, EU Commission guidelines on methodology and non-financial key performance indicators are still forthcoming, the EU directive points out which exactly are going to be the information needed in order to accomplish the legal requirements. So, again, th there's um, some guidelines in the report that they want us to work towards, but they're still not uh, fully detailed um, as to exactly what we need. So um, again, we'll see how that, that comes on in, in national legislation. Um, with the introduction of this directive on the disclosure of non-financial and diversity information, listed companies and some of the others like banks or insurance organizations will have to include in their management reports detailed information about their environmental, social, and employee-related issues. They're also going to have to look at diversity in their board of directors and, and human rights and anti-corruption policies, and they're going to have to report on the outcomes of these. So it, it's expanding the current corporate and social responsibility um, reporting structure quite a lot. Um, it's designed to um, provide transparency and, um, and increase the knowledge of impacts and risks um, in the operations of these companies. And the EU directive states that the management report is the default part of the corporate re reporting, whereas the non-financial statement should be included. Now, what that means is that um, you're all, uh, those companies that are already reporting uh, will have to include an element of this uh, EU directive within their, their report now. So it, their annual report won't just be financial, it will include these areas. 
Um, but it is a bit flexible in that area in that um, you can ref you can you will be able to submit the non-financial statement as a separate report if it covers the same financial year as the management report. So they're not saying that you should put it all into one report. They are saying that you, should, you need to report this, but you can report it in a separate report. And that would have to be audited by an auditor to verify that the non-financial statement has covered the EU regulations. Um, so the concrete nature and the substantial innovations regarding the requirement of disclosure will be clarified once the national implementation has been drafted into by 2016. So um, again, what we're going to see is that um, we will we'll see more of this appearing within national legislation. And it's probably likely that um, once, it's, once it's clarified, um, it will the law will probably work around some of the frameworks that are already in place, such as the Global Reporting Initiative, the International Labour Organization in Initiative, the United Global Compact Initiative, the EU Reporting Guidelines, or even the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Guidelines. We, we reckon that, personally, having read the, 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 the um, directive, that the, the national laws will be based around some of these um, to, to bring companies into a, a similar playing field so we can start seeing uh, and benchmarking and, and looking at the differences between companies when they're all reporting in a similar manner. So that's what I see is going to happen here. So the question is where um, is this going to uh, come into effect? Well, it's anywhere in the European economic area. So any, any country that's in that European economic area is going to be affected. Um, and it's going to address um, large companies um, significantly, it states, with more than 500 employees, included listed companies as well as other public interests such as the banks, insurance companies, and companies that are so designated by the member states because of their activity size and number of employees. So that actually has got quite a wide remit, and it's estimated that initially the EU is estimating that it's going to be about 6,000 companies that will need to adapt to this legislation. Well, according to the European Commission, nowadays less than 10% of large European companies are regularly reporting the non-financial information. But in the meantime, what has happened is Denmark have come to the, to the fore as the first European company to transpose the directive by amending their Danish Financial Statements Act in May 2015. So we've already got one of the EU member states, and there may be others that I'm not aware of, but um, this one in particular um, I'm going to point out because following the, the reporting requirements for a smaller set of large stock and listed and state-owned companies to be affected by 2015, um, it's already come to light that more than a thousand companies overall will need to comply with this in, the, in, in Denmark alone. So this illustrates that across the EU, the number of companies ultimately affected may be much higher than initially expected. So we can see that um, already, but just by those figures, and they're they're very um, they're, they're very sort of uh, average figures at the moment. There's no detailed figures behind that, but you can already see if 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 every single member state had more than a thousand companies, would easily going to exceed that six six thousand companies. And beyond that, for those companies required to, to, to start reporting, and they're going to have to start asking suppliers to provide them with CSR information for their reports. And this, again, is going to um, put more pressure down the supply chain. So I think what we're going to start seeing is that the supply chains are going to start to have to comply a lot more with, with, with what these companies are requiring. And so, again, it, it, I think it, initially it's going to include the so-called 500 employees and listed companies, but very quickly, this is going to scale down and go down through the, the supply chain. So I think we're, the, the effect of this is going to be quite far-ranging. Um, so what happens if, if your company is not headquartered in an EU country, but you've got a subsidiary working um, in that EU uh, ec economic area? Um, so for instance, um, we'll take Liechtenstein. Um, they will be impacted by incorporating um, incorporation of the directive into the annexes or protocols of the European economic agreements. So they're going to be affected also, and, and that these amendments are going to require that um, they actually comply with the directive also. So 
even if you've got a larger group of companies that are not headquartered in the EU, they will be impacted by mandatory reporting requirements. And the non-EU headquartered corporations that do business in the EU member states via local subsidiaries that fall under the directive requirements, the, these are going to have to produce uh, um, reports that cover in the non-financial statement. But many corporate group and holding companies will probably elect to publish a non-financial report that meets the EU requirements and probably a restrictive directive of the implementation that they can um, to include their subsidiaries rather than having the subsidiaries producing their own reports. So it's going to be quite wide ranging. Um, so what should you do about it um, if you're a company out there that meets these requirements? Well, first of all, you could wait. Um, I would suggest this is the best option, but you could sit there and wait until the directive is translated into national law. There'd be no investment required, um, but on the downside, when it actually does be impl become implemented, you may find that um, there will be a large outlay in, in, in cash in order to, in order to um, implement it. You could build it gradually, uh, and this is what most people are doing nowadays. Um, they're deciding to um, implement a, a, a robust framework um, using the available frameworks that are out there, such as GRI. A lot of people are reporting on GRI 3, and, 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 and as, as of October this year, probably GRI 4 as well. Um, so um, we're starting to see that um, companies are already doing this internally. Um, they see it as um, a demonstrator of their commitment to their sustainability programs. Um, they're doing it because they have uh, customer uh, pressure or even um, they've got stakeholder pressure from either governments or internally. Um, and also the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, these do help increase market differentiators. The downside of, of this gradual build-up is that there is a big capital investment initially. Um, and uh, an increase in staffage to, uh, staffing to monitor and manage and, and sort of control the data collection process and what goes on after that. Joe, do you want to add to this? Yeah, it's it's a good point. That you should be able to, yeah. Um, I think from my perspective, one of the interesting things is that this kind of gradual expansion of sustainability has become, as was gained momentum would probably use way of putting it over the last couple of years. So as more leg legislative pressure has been applied, as more frameworks have been made available, as more customers and suppliers have been able to or expected to have this information, then then that's happening. It's 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 certainly an interesting move and it's an interesting trans transition. Um, that's about it really on that one. I'll, I'm very conscious of time so I'll let it go back to David and I'll stop talking. Thanks. We're 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 running on a bit so um I'll get on to the last point in this. Um, the other option, really, and we're starting to see some some real nice companies doing this, um, becoming a knowledge leader. So um, we've got companies out there who are already publishing and making sure that it's very well known that they are doing this. That, um, for instance, Marks and Spencers, um, there is a plan A, but there's no plan B. Everybody pretty much knows about that. It's very widely publicised. It's publicised within the shops. It's publicised within the stores, um, everybody understands that they're doing this and they um, have increased their engagement with their customers and suppliers because of it. Um, the investor confidence has gone up, the stakeholder engagement has gone up, the media and social platform recognition is something that people are really dying for nowadays because so much of our uh, life is now controlled by media and social um, social platforms that you need to be there in order to be seen nowadays. And so being an acknowledged leader and showing yourself on these areas is where is where we really all ought to be aiming for. Um, and as a result, it, 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 Marks and Spencers, for instance, have managed to increase their market share dramatically by doing this. Um, so it just goes to show it's not something that's just being done for the, for the investors and for the management. This is actually being done um, in these particular cases as a way of, of business. It is a sustainable part of business. Um, and without doing this and without seeing more of this, um, I think that uh, companies who don't look to become a, an acknowledged leader or at least stick their heads above the parapet may suffer um, in their reputation and, and um, 
that would lead to a loss of business, I think. So um, the bottom line to all of these reportings is that um, initially there's a cost involved, but in the long term the, there's a saving on your baseline, um, and it's well, very well worth doing in our in our eyes. And, and from what we've seen, uh, from our experience of working with some large companies, um, it, it it does make a difference. So that's that's the end of um, what I need to say. Um, I think um, we will have to watch and see what happens with the EU directive um, and how it's implemented into national government. I think our changes on, in, in 2013 went a long way to, to meeting it. I think for the UK in particular, there's probably going to be some slight tweaks to our own directives, um, but we'll see, so we'll see what happens. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope that's given you some um, insight into the EU directive and what effect it's going to have. Um, it may even have raised some questions that you may have uh, regarding it, and it may even hopefully make you want to go back and look at your own um, uh, sustainability program and make sure that you're already covering the areas that are going to come in in the next year or so. So um, we're going to go on to questions. I'm going to hand over to Joe, who's going to control the questions. Um, so, uh, Joe. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. So we are running a little bit late, so we'll try and go through these as quickly as possible. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, Francesca asked quite a technical question about the uh, the name of the financial standard that w that's been putting, uh, that's been adapted in Denmark. So that might be quite a quick answer from you, David, if you know the name. If we don't, we'll follow up afterwards. Okay. Um, well, I'll follow up afterwards. Gonna... Okay. Um, I did look it up, but I am getting it in front of me. That sounds good. Um, so... A question here is, when does the directive have to be transposed by? Well, the, it, it came into place in 2014, so two years. Um, so it has to be transposed by um, 2016. Um, so we're expecting that it will be effective um, within the 2017 reporting. So, it, yeah, so definitely one of these things is coming around the corner. Um, so. This is quite interesting. So do you think national law will extend requirements to a wider scope of types of companies? That's it. I mean, from my perspective, and I, I don't know, I'll, I'll let David talk about this in a moment, but I think what we've seen is that absolutely that is the case. You look, obviously, we started with some of the FTSE stuff with GHG reporting that came in during the last session of Parliament. Obviously, ESOS is even, you know, is even you know, more granted that this you know, requires even smaller companies. So I think my short answer would be yes. David, I don't know if you have a view on this one. Do you think that, you know? I think it's going to. There's no two ways about it. The fact that it's expanding the reporting requirements to um, areas that we, we probably don't have in our financial re reports nowadays um, to uh, show, the di for instance, the diversity of, the diversity of the board. These these things are definitely going to expand. Um, I think the fact that, um, for me, the fact that it's going to run down the supply chain as time goes on means that it's going to hit a lot more companies. It's going to take in, into account a lot more types of companies. Um, and eventually, I think pretty much most companies uh, in, in the near future will be doing some kind of reporting of this nature. They'll have to. Hmm. Okay, um, so let's see, we've got... There's a lot of questions. Well, she's a, da, 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 da. Let's see what we can do very quickly. Does the directive require UK companies to do anything beyond current requirements of the FRC strategy report? I'm not sure it does, but David, do you have a... Not that I'm aware of at the moment. Hmm. Um, however, we're waiting to see how the directive gets um, put into legislation in the, in the UK. I think what we'll see is we'll see some slight tweaks to what we're already doing. Um, Okay, if we do one more, because I realize we're pretty much out of time. So is there any chance that national law will require companies to report based on specific standards, for example, GRI? I think I, I can't help but want to answer this one a little bit myself, um, which is that it touches, because it touches on a very interesting area. There's so many different frameworks available. Obviously, there's, you know, there's GRI, which has been important. There's, uh, there's guys like Ecovadis who do an awful lot over in the states and obviously backed by Bloomberg so with an awful lot of 
financial crowd behind them. You've got SASB, but as well, you've got things like CDP, you've got FTSE for good, you've got the DHS. Um, I think there's too many of them at the moment for one framework to be kind of given a seal of approval of this is the one you should use. Um, but there's always that potential. I think, I think we'll probably see that legislation will be quite um, flexible in terms of what it suggests. So it was, yeah, things like what we've seen with, with the carbon reporting requirement for FTSE companies. You've got to report scope one and two emissions is all they really say. Obviously, it makes an awful lot of sense to do that as part of something else. But yeah, that's my own personal thinking. David, do you have a thought on that? Um, I, I, it, I, I doubt very much if law will say that you have to use GRI or you have to use um, global um, impact or any of those. I, don't, I think it will give you the requirements. How you get to reporting those requirements will be individually down to you. Um, I don't think that any, any of the uh, legislative um, changes will actually favor any one particular framework. Um, however, uh, saying that, there may be frameworks that are uh, adopted nationally, which may be put into the, the as, as highly recommended. Um, again, it will be down to each member state to find to, to define how they want that to be done. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Okay, I am very conscious we are now completely out of time. So I, I know there are questions we haven't got to. Ian, Jane, Carmen, there's a couple of others as well. Uh, what we will do is make sure we follow up by our email with you guys. There was also a question about whether or not this will be available. Absolutely, we have a YouTube channel. It is full of amazing things, which is mainly us talking about stuff like this. Um, but we'll make sure you get a link to this specific video. And obviously, there are others there that you can look at as well. Thank you very much for your time on this, I have to be honest, very grey morning over here in Bristol. Um, have a lovely day and keep an eye out because I'm sure there will be many more of these briefings we do. And they're always, certainly from our perspective, fun to do. Um, which follows on to the final point. If you do think that we should be talking about something, if you do have a question or a, a wider topic you'd like to hear us talk about, don't be afraid to drop us an email. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a lovely day.